This is The Speaking Show. I'm David Newman, and you're tuned in to the number one podcast for speakers, consultants, and experts who want to speak more profitably. I am here with David Wolf, audiobook guru, and David's website is audiobooksolution.com. How are you, my friend? I am doing great, David. Thanks so much for uh, doing this and for having me with you. I think a lot of folks that either have a book or want a book, whether it's self-published, traditionally published, maybe it's out of print, maybe it's an ancient book, sure. they're seeing a lot of action with audiobooks. And uh, as you probably know, David, audible.com is going into a huge push of original content, almost like Netflix for your ears. Yep. So I would say that right now for thought leaders, speakers, experts, audio and audio books in particular are the hot thing. More than podcasts, more than video, more than Facebook Live. You look at the investment that a giant company like Amazon is putting in because Amazon owns Audible. Exactly. They are going to dominate our earlobes. So uh, let's just talk about audio in general and why and how it has become so preeminent. And then I have got a million questions for you about audiobooks, the do's and don'ts and tips and practice. Yeah, yeah, no, I love the question thing. And, and, and thank you, David. And a little bit about how I got into this. I'm a music producer that over the past 15 or 20 years evolved from doing abstract, you know, music scoring for radio, TV, and film into uh, getting excited and passionate about the spoken word side of the business, which is not something I knew anything about until I became a podcaster. And then from that led me into the audiobook side. So audio... And you really have sort of framed this out very well. Audio is a way that we can distribute our content, our thought leader content, business leader, thought leader, coaches, speakers, et cetera, that doesn't require that we're sitting and doing it. And in a world where we have, even if it's not real, there's a perceived scarcity of time available to sit and read. So I think consequently, what this has driven the audiobook consumer side of the market. And so all of us who are generating content through our writing now have a new way to open up a new, entirely new audience that otherwise we may not ever reach simply because they don't feel like they have the time to sit and read. Yeah, no, a really great point. It is the ultimate portable media. <laughs> the hypermobile folds into this. You mentioned Audible. Uh, you know, it's Audible, Amazon, iTunes are the sort of, the, the, most of the market is concentrated. I have a list of about 30 plus other sort of call them nichier more alternative retail online channels for audiobook distribution. We use and leverage them for uh, those who want to work with us on that. And um, distribution is a whole subject in and of itself. But, oh, yes. Um, but uh, there are uh, public libraries, university libraries that buy copies, digital copies of audiobooks and then rent them out you know, to the members right. of their libraries. I am woefully ignorant about the ins and outs of audiobooks because my book was traditionally published when, and here's what's also fascinating about this, when we were going to produce the audiobook, yeah. they're like, oh no, David, we have that taken care of. And I was like, yeah. excuse me? So no, no, we're going to have voiceover talent. We're going to, you know, you don't need to be involved. And I said, no, no, I do need to be involved because I'm a speaker. I'm a public figure. I'm the author. It would be weird for my followers not to hear my voice. So we had that battle. I won the battle and they sent me into a studio for two days. They recorded the book and then magically it appeared on audible.com on the same Amazon page as right. the ebook and the print book and the audio book. Yep. When self-published authors come to me and they say, David, how do audiobooks work? I say, uh, you go to a studio and you record it and then the rest I don't know. If I'm a self-published author, and I want to get that audiobook out there into the marketplace. What's step one? What's step two? What's step three? How do I get going? I, lo I love this. And, and my process may be, I like to think it's a little bit different and unique in the market. So I'll tell you a little bit about how I think about all of this. The first thing I do is I do a 15, 20 minute call with the author to determine the first question is, and you pointed right to this, are you a thought leader? that where your voice is uh, connected to your brand in a very major and deep way for your audience. Not every, it's not true of all of them. Many of them, we see this trend. I'm doing more and more author read versions of audiobooks 
and at the same time, we're still doing a lot with professional voiceovers for a variety of reasons. And each you know, case is kind of unique. But that's the first question I want to get out of the way is it's like this first fork in the road. All right. So if we're going to hire a professional talent to do it, there's more forks in the road. But basically, this is what we do. We do a casting call. And together, I work collaboratively with the thought leader to find a professional voiceover that we feel can, to the extent possible, embody and own the content as if it were the author reading themselves. It doesn't always mean matching the sound of their voice, but it can often mean that just because that's where we tend to go. Does he sound like me? Does she sound like me? Now, you really touched on something that's major because this is a trend and it's really become more and more of my business as it evolves and grows. I am helping authors who are the, the voice of their brand perform their own read and uh, everything that's required to get that raw audio, that source recording, as I like to call it, into a finished audio book ready for distribution on all the places online, on uh, Audible, iTunes, and Amazon, and then the 30 others that I, I mentioned a moment ago. So the way this process works is, so you think studio, and you mentioned this a moment ago, and one of the innovations that's come about, and I'm really modeling my whole business around this for a, a lot of reasons, It'll become obvious as I tell you how it works. So I'm using a platform called Squadcast. And what is Squadcast? Squadcast is a conferencing platform that records much like we're doing now on a Zoom call. However, Zoom and Skype do not produce audio that's acceptable quality for audiobook production. ACX is the back end of audible.com, Amazon, and iTunes. And that's who I deal with when we're submitting the final audio, uploading the cover. When we do the back end support after the title is completely recorded and posted and edited, we're working with ACX and they have very stringent requirements for audio. And if you're not versed in audio production, you can have a lot of headaches. So we strip all of that away. Back to Squadcast. So what Squadcast does is what they did. And it's about a product that's about two years old. They're just out of beta. And I love these guys. They're really good. I use that platform to record authors all over the world. And I'm producing hundreds and hundreds of hours of content like this. What it does is we ship them or I recommend a good microphone for them to use. And we situate them in a room where, you know, it doesn't have to be for professional like this, but it's not reflective or echoey or, uh, you know, glass and tile and, you know, it can be problematic. It's a warm sounding room. I plan the first session and we schedule two hours at a time to record. When we use the Squadcast system, it's not recording their voice through the internet. It's actually recording it on their local computer. They don't handle any of it. It's happening in the background. So we're doing our conferencing thing so I can coach them on the read. And, oh, David, you, you sloughed that word over there. Let's pick it up at the previous paragraph. Or can I get a better take on this one? I think you've got a little more emotion for that line. Whatever it is, I'm playing producer for two hours at a time, progressive scheduling until we get the whole thing recorded. And after each session, I'm grabbing those files from the, your local computer, if you're the guy I'm recording, and bringing them in-house for uh, editing and post-production to get them ready for Audible, Amazon, and iTunes. So that's the production step. You might ask, since uh, you're, you're infinitely curious, what's the process of post-production? So we create these raw recordings. The way we deliver them is each section is its own audio file. So when I'm recording, open and closing credits, we record it, and then we move on. Preface, we record it, we move on. Chapter one, record it, move on. So each is a separate file. Each of those files are meticulously edited. It's more than podcast editing. It's, we're really looking for a more pristine performance. Now, that said, I have had a few where some of a level of improvisation was acceptable and we go with it. But for the most part, we're adhering to the manuscript and uh, producing the best performance I can get from that author. They're not a professional voiceover. And that's why we only do two hours at a time because you get tired, you get fatigued, you get dehydrated and uh, you, know, you just you can't do too much at, in one sitting. So uh, we stretch out these two hour blocks until we get it all done. And then we go through this meticulous editing process. After that, we do noise reduction because we've got to meet those ACX specs that I talked about earlier and the mastering process. And then we upload all the files to uh, Amazon, iTunes and Audible, ACX. And within 14 business days, they're approved and suddenly it's up for sale. So you'll see that exact audiobook right there on your Amazon page, right alongside the ebook version and the hard copy version. That's exactly right. And I, sorry if I got too in the weeds with the process, but if anyone wants more information, they can always uh, find me. But um, yes, the end result is you will see on the Amazon page, you'll have all the versions of your book side by side. 
Now, there's another a little nuance to the versions. Uh, you may have seen that Amazon has a product called WhisperSync. What is WhisperSync? So WhisperSync says that you can switch between the ebook and the audiobook, and you can keep your place if you're using the uh, app that Amazon has. In order to qualify or be eligible as a title for WhisperSync, the audio needs to match the manuscript or the ebook by about 97%. And they have uh, some approach to analyzing that. And if it meets the criteria, you can be eligible to have a whisper sync version in addition to your other versions that are on your Amazon page. Hey, good looking. Are you currently getting paid to speak? Would you like to ramp that up? We can help. Book a confidential speaker strategy call with our team at doitmarketing.com slash call. And let's see what we might do together. The call is free, but the results may be priceless. Now, if I'm looking at this as an original content idea, so my buddy Phil Jones, who is also a um, guest here on The Speaking Show, yeah. he just did an audio exclusive project, meaning there is no book, there right. is no ebook. Right. It's just an audio program that people get as part of their Audible subscription, and it's some original content. Is creating an audiobook or a series of audiobooks a viable strategy to create audio exclusive content? And how are you seeing that coming down the pike as possibly something in the future that people won't even ask, hey, do you have a book? They will first ask, hey, do you have an audio book I could listen to? Or That's a cool question. And one of the reasons it's cool is there's a little bit of a gap that you've uh, found for me. So this person you mentioned, are they distributing the audio-only product on audible.com? Well, Audible hired them and paid him a lot of money. This is legit. This is like a traditional okay. publishing deal, quote unquote. But done through audio. Audible. It's done through Audible. So the way the ACX system works is you have to have an existing version of the title. It can be an ebook, but because as a producer, what I do is I go up and claim the title for a publisher that I'm working with when we're, we're working with multiple authors or for an individual author who we create their own ACX Amazon uh, Audible account, we go in and claim the title. So for an outside production house, I think this is the answer we need. For an outside producer like me that's working with authors, there is not a way to produce pure product. It sounds like Audible is, and you mentioned this earlier, like the Netflix strategy, right? They're creating their own content and reaching out to content creators to do audio-only productions, which is not something outside producers can do, to my knowledge. I'm going to research that a bit, but I don't think it's possible. Yeah. No, well, guys. it's very interesting because I think this is an emerging, we're on the cutting edge of this Absolutely. Now, that Absolutely. original content is not going to be a book. It's not going to be an ebook. It's not going to be a webinar or a video. Original right. content is going to be audio only. I think it's brilliant. And if Audible opens up this original audio content market, like the way we do podcasts, I think that would be absolutely terrific. And of course, I'd be all over that as an audio producer right. on both sides of that marketplace. You know, For sure. When people come to you, David, and maybe they've already done an audio book on their own, yeah. mm -hmm. and I'm cringing as I say that, and my face is getting all squishy. What are some audiobook don'ts that people that either do this on their own or hire someone who's kind of right. a, an well, audio person, but not an audio book expert, because there's audio experts, and yeah. then there's you who's genuinely an audio book expert. What train wrecks have you seen or what mistakes should we be avoiding? So the environment you record in uh, needs to be quiet. We touched on this a little bit earlier. Um, it's not necessarily to go into a an overbuilt or fancy, expensive, by the hour, brick and mortar studio. It's perfectly acceptable to have a home set up much like you would a podcaster. The difference being that because of the audio spec requirements at Audible, Amazon, and iTunes, you need to have some knowledge of how to work a mic. You need to be have a reasonably good quality mic. I tend to like these uh, the AT series from Audio Technica. Uh, you can get them in USB or you can get them um, uh, as a uh, dynamic microphone with phantom power. For more on this, 
feel free to reach out to me at, at uh, audiobooksolution.com and just reach out and we can do a quick call and I can help you with that stuff. ACX creates a list of do's and don'ts, which really kind of is reverse engineered from what they're looking for, which talks about the room, no extraneous noises. There is no long one file for an audiobook. Again, we deliver them in little chunks as small as this is title written by author, narrated by author. That's required at the beginning and at the end. This has been audiobook title, written by, narrated by. They require the opening and closing credits. So there's certain file requirements and you end up uploading them in sequence. Back to the do's and don'ts. So noise floors, noise in the room is one of the biggest things that most people that aren't used to dealing in the audio production arena uh, don't think about and aren't aware of. Quality of the microphone. We do a lot of editing and that's common. You know, I worked in the broadcast industry for many years, even with professional voiceovers, you're constantly doing retakes and outtakes and getting it. And then you end up stitching it together with nonlinear editing platforms like Pro Tools or I use DP9 or, you know, whatever logic, whatever it is that the uh, Audacity is a free one that's out there that people may be familiar with. There are numerous audio platforms for the DIY person where they can do the editing. Sometimes a crossfade is required. I mean, it's very, it's minutia work. I mean, I uh, have a team of four guys that do this for me. And when you're talking about a five to 10 hour audio product, uh, it's generally about three to four times the actual running time to do the edit, if you can believe that. So if, if an author feels like they can you know, whip out their iPhone and record it and hope it's going to be accepted by Audible, that would be the extreme side of the spectrum, David, in terms of unacceptable uh, quality uh, or quality control or lack thereof. Did I answer your question? Is there more? Yes. No, very much so. That's great. David, let's talk about the money side of this. Obviously, when we create an audio book, we want to monetize that. And some speakers have a um, e-commerce page, like a store or a resources page. Here's my book. Here's my CD. Here's my video series. Here's whatever. Because we're kind of locked into this Amazon slash Audible platform, can I sell this audiobook directly from my website or am I locked into some arrangement where I just have to link to it off-site? Both options are available, David. Audible allows you the ability to choose whether you want an exclusive distribution agreement on Audible, Amazon, and iTunes or a non-exclusive agreement on those three sites. So what's the difference? If you sign an exclusive, it's a seven-year lock on that deal and you're paid 40% of sales, that's the most you'll make from Audible, Amazon, iTunes is 40%. The other ones that I mentioned that are sort of out the top, and I have a long list of them that anyone who wants that list, you know, get, reach out and I can tell you what these other distributions, they range, they pay as much as 70% of sales. But Audible, Amazon, and iTunes pays 40 for an, an exclusive and for a non-exclusive, they pay net royalties of 25%. Okay, so those are the numbers. Now, here's the thing about Audible, Amazon, and iTunes. <laughs> and it's a little painful to say, but we don't control the price. Why that is and how it came about, I'm not entirely clear about. But there is a, a chart that's available. And if you search for it, you can probably find it, or I've got it if someone wants it, where the running time of the audiobook correlates to the way Amazon, Audible, and iTunes will price your book. And they will price it. And then I believe after it's live on the market, and again, some of this is black box, David, but there is um, an algorithm approach to how many copies are selling. And I believe there's a little bit of, um, I mean, I think this is a dynamic pricing model. I don't think it's a static thing. So just be aware that when you're doing an audio book, you're not going to control the retail price for those three sites. Although the other sites you have the ability to set, you know, it's $9.99, it's $12.99, it's $20, whatever it is. But Audible specifically, Amazon and iTunes, you do not. And so that's important on the pricing side. On the production side of pricing, I like to think I have an unusual model. I'll just, it's a bit of a shameless plug. When I produce an, an author, like we were discussing, we charge by the word, not by the hour of studio time. So I have authors that have booked time and had to reschedule, or we only did an hour that day, or this is where this two hour virtual recording platform really comes in handy because we lock the project rate for them at 7.2 cents a word. So that's our pricing today. And that's all in. That includes me recording with you as your producer, all of the editing, all the post-production, and all the back-end uploading it to 
the ACX platform for Audible, Amazon, and iTunes. And if you want more distribution, we can take it out to another platform such as Find Away Voices or Authors Republic, where they offer it up to more places and you'll have a non-exclusive with Audible, Amazon, and iTunes because they include those. Right. Uh, there's a lot of information here. So No, that sounds great. It's really but, smart. Uh, uh, but those are the, the per word because that's all inclusive and then there's no guessing, right? So 10,000 words is 720. 20,000 words is 1440. Just keep doing the math. Exactly. And- Act now, kids, because those prices will be going up. All I add to that is that I, I work very often with authors that, that don't, and thank you, uh, that, that don't want to do it all in one big chunk. Because, you know, you'd be talking about a 2,500, 3,000, even $5,000 project. I will do, you know, a third down and then spread out payments. I'm very, very sensitive to the, the plight of cash flow in, the, in a small business environment. So that's just something to know in terms of how I work. So when people ask me, what's my ROI? It's a challenging question because like podcasting, and we'll talk about podcasting in a subsequent episode, but the ROI isn't always what it appears to be. Like, for example, I think a lot of authors and publishers I'm working with are using the audio to bolster the sales of the in-store or print or ebook versions and not necessarily thinking of it in terms of a monetary ROI, but it's just more content marketing and more distribution of their messaging. What a great episode. Wowza. Tell you what, if you want to ramp up your revenue as an expert who speaks professionally, you should really check out our free online training at doitmarketing.com slash webinar. Now, let's go back to the pricing for a quick second. Sure. If I'm a quote unquote self-publishing on Audible, I upload, they price it, they do whatever I want. But David, when you and I are done together... Don't I have a high quality digital audio file that I can put on my website and say, listen, this is going to go into my e-commerce store. Absolutely. I'm going to sell just the digital download for 15 bucks. Absolutely. It's on Audible for 10, but you want to get it from me. Here it is. And I can charge whatever I want. Yes. If you do the non-exclusive, you have free reign. You can sell it anywhere and however you want. You can even produce CD copies, you know, physical CDs, which some people have asked me about recently. And it's funny, I haven't really, first of all, we don't do that in-house, but CDs as a way to get the book out is, I don't see a lot of it. I'll just say it like right. that. Right. Well, I think physical media is going like the diet. Yeah, it doesn't make so. sense, but it's so expensive to do. But uh, yeah, you could set up a shopping cart and sell it as a direct downloadable from wherever you want. Absolutely. Now let's talk about royalties because I know that you know uh, Amazon slash Audible, they're not necessarily a publisher. Is there any such thing as an advance when no. I do an audio book or the royalty is just my revenue share when copies are sold? Exactly. It's revenue when copies are show- sold. And again, for exclusive, it's 40%. For non-exclusive, it's 25%. And of course, I'm talking about where most of the market is, Audible, Amazon, iTunes. Very interesting. Yeah. If somebody wants to get started and, you know, when you're at the strategy phase of any kind of publishing project and you want to be thinking, okay, I'd like to write a book and you have a vision maybe in your head of what the print book might look like. You're thinking maybe about the ebook. Are there considerations like do some things not translate well to an audio book format? Love this question. One of the things, I have one publisher that has, um, and we've built in a process, and this has become a part of my process for everyone I work with. There are cases where you're going to have graphic elements, charts, graphs, even photos that are simply not going to translate. And so there are a couple of ways to manage that. One is you can do what I like to call write-arounds, where you can take the graphic information, the content in the book in line and simply describe what it's saying without referencing the chart at all or the graph or the visual and just simply verbalize it instead. The other way you can do it is simply have a a, a message that you repeat or you say at the beginning and the end to reinforce it that says, hey, to see this particular piece of information that's graphic in nature, visit our website and you can find a downloadable PDF or you can just look at this page. So you'd push them out and it's the traffic driver to your website in that instance, push them out to the website. So those are the two major ways that we use when doing a recording manuscript. Some of them read just as they are. Some of them, as we're going, we'll catch uh, in a little phrase like, in the instance I cited above, 
and there's no above. It's, it's the thing we just talked about in time. So different authors are, are sensitive and keyed into this uh, than others. Uh, I have a doctor that I'm working with now. He's doing a very long book. And where the, the word book appeared, he changed it to audiobook because he really wanted to be addressing the product at hand. So it's not unacceptable to just read it as it is. But if you do have graphic elements, chances are we want to do either the write around or a referring website to get that information in graphic form. Totally. And you mentioned something that I think a lot of people need to kind of rewind, go back, re-listen to what David just said. You said traffic driver. Mm. So a lot of times, whether it's a print book or an ebook or an audio book, the faulty thinking is, oh my gosh, it's Amazon. It's Audible. They've got billions of visits every single day. If I put it out there, it's just automatically going to sell. And like a book, and like a podcast, and like anything else that we have in our arsenal, it needs to be your audiobook needs to be actively marketed. Well, your ebook does too, and your paper book, <laughs> and your podcast, sure. and everything that you're doing. Have you seen some really clever traffic drivers where someone integrates this audiobook into their business and integrates the business into their audiobook? What I'm saying is the audiobook sales drive leads, inquiries, clicks, website traffic, uh, or the offline business drives people to the audiobook in the email signature file or in their social profiles. Or how do we have that sort of self referential system where almost on a daily basis, we are promoting this audiobook in some way, shape, or form? Well, I think in, in a way, you've, if I'm understanding your question right, at the end of the question was the answer or part of the answer. And that is, is that you have to be very persistent about promoting all of the versions. What I see most of the time is all of the versions are promoted, which include audio, which is kind of what we were talking about earlier in this segment, so that the consumer has a choice about how they want to consume. To, I think what you're asking is, is really, again, the answer is a, a persistent social campaign that drives traffic to the landing page for your book on Amazon would be, to my thinking, the most effective way to keep the book out there, to give people a choice. Some people are old, older school, and they, I say almost old school or older school, right? They want to smell the, the print and have the book in their hand, and it's a particular thing that they really appreciate about the reading experience, and they're not just not going to do audio. It's not something they're, they're comfortable with. Others will only do audio and then some kind of go back and forth. So I think it's just about keeping it out in front of people as often as possible and reminding them that audio is one of the ways they can consume the content. I'm not sure I actually answered your question, but you'll tell me. No, I think, well, that was a great supplement and compliment answer. And we'll just kind of keep rolling the way we're going here, which All brings right. up another question. Hopefully helpful. Which is, if I've written my book a year ago, two years ago, three years ago, five years ago, yeah. based on the Amazon algorithms or any other consideration, is it ever too late to add an audio book if I don't already have one in my previously published material? I don't think it is. And this may sound a little self-serving, but in fact, I've had a few conversations going with publishers now that have a back catalog of you know, hundreds of, of titles that they're interested in re-releasing as audio. So what it does is it gives you a new reason. It's kind of like Blu-ray, right? It gives you a new reason to mention it, to put a PR release out on it. And then in addition to all of that, the sort of the reboost of the publicity and the visibility of the product and content, you also are going to unlock a new audience that otherwise they just don't have time to read. Back to our original point, which is yeah. what's driving the audio side of the market, which by the way is growing. I wanted to get this in. It's growing at uh, between 25 and 29% year over year that since 2015. It's unbelievable. It's a $2 billion market. And I assume that that's the amount consumers are spending to buy them. And uh, about 80,000 or more audiobooks are released every year right now. So a couple of numbers to just give you a sense of it. You know. Yeah, it's really mind-bending. It's very, very yeah. encouraging and exciting. Like I said at the top of our interview, that this is really current, hot right now. You got to get in on this right now. Yeah. All audiobooks have been around forever, just like podcasts have been around forever. But now is a super hot time for both, actually. 
It is. The audio thing, I'm really delighted, obviously, as a radio and longtime music producer, because everything I've ever you know, worked on is, is the audio or theater of the mind or bringing audio to life. So this is a delightful time in media history to be around. <laughs> For sure. So did you happen to see, this is just so funny because this is like very, very current. Sure. Less than a month ago, the New York Times ran a full page ad and it was a full page spread. It yeah. was an extreme close up of a human ear and it was to launch their New York Times audio series. Whoa. And you're thinking, okay, well, what is this gigantic ear? So I'm not sure how tall, you know, this is by right, two feet tall is a full page ad in the, you know, traditionally formatted yeah. newspaper. Gigantic yeah. ear. It's this gigantic ear. And you see a little bit of hairs and some pores and whatnot. Lovely. Like, yeah. What the hell is this? And it was the New York Times launching a big launch, obviously very, very big, around their new audio product. They want to get into your ears, people. You mentioned, David, about old book, new audio book, great opportunity to reboot, relaunch, et cetera. I know that when we do a traditional book of any kind, a paper book, we do a book launch. Is there such a thing as an audio book launch? And how do we, whether the book is new, old, or in between, what might be some considerations for an audio book launch strategy? Well, one of the things that comes with an audiobook release on any of the platforms is this little retail sampler. It's actually required. When we produce, we have to take a chunk of the book, three to five minutes long. And if you look on an Amazon page for any author that has audio, you'll see under the audio, there's this little listen now to a sample and there's a little button you click. So that's required. So that little clip can be a marvelous tool. Do we get uh, to choose that or no? Yes, we do. The producer, now, sometimes the author doesn't, you know, for us, we'll, we'll go in and pick a random place. It can't be a promotion. It has to be an actual excerpt from the book. Three to five minutes long, five at the longest, and it's delivered with the product. And it's part of the approval that they go through. It's about a 14 business day approval process. And if you don't have that sampler, they're going to kick you back and say, we need the sampler. So they require it, but you get to choose what it is. It just can't have music and it can't be promotion. But what you could do is you could use that and wrap a little promotional mini sewed for your podcast or put it out on Instagram with a video sync, uh, you know, a short video and promote it like it use a, you mentioned, I think before we were rolling here about a, uh, a video teaser that you use uh, to promote uh, books and so forth. Same with audio because you've got this living, breathing audio file that you can then put pictures to and the cover of the book by the way, the covers are something that they're not the same aspect ratio. In the audio market, it needs to be 2,400 by 2,400 pixel minimum 72 DPI square. So for clients that we work with, we'll let them know. And if they don't have resources, we help them do it. But it's, the good news is it's a square. So that works well on Instagram and some of these other places where you know the rectangles don't quite they get clipped or weird right. things can happen. You have to letterbox them, whatever. Well, last couple of quick questions. I'm so glad sure. that you threw that in, by the way, about the audiobook cover. I know that when we're doing a podcast, when we're doing a traditional book, mm -hmm. ratings and reviews are mm. hugely important, especially during that initial launch. Yep. Are ratings and reviews equally important for our audio books. Absolutely. It's just another version of the content and it requires the same level of care and attention in terms of um, audience testimonials, responses uh, in cases where we've hired voiceover talent. I've even had authors, uh, we did a project for a guy named Tom Dutta, a wonderful book called The Quiet Warrior. And we hired a voiceover guy named Chris Abel. And he actually attributed in the promotion material, this is not a testimonial, but it's, it's sort of in this mix of communicating about the audiobook. Uh, he said, kudos to Chris Abel for doing the blah, 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 blah. So, uh, and for reading the book so wonderfully. So back to the, the testimonial and review side, you have to ask for them and you have to really get people to give you great reviews because word of mouth is everything in this economy and, and the media just sort of bolsters that and amplifies the voice of, of the customer. Totally. Well, David Wolf, thank you, thank you, thank you. We have to have you back to talk about podcasts, but I've got two final questions for you. Yes, sir. The final, final question is where can people go to learn more about you and get connected and stay connected to your awesomeness? But before that, second to last question is, 
If people were to take one key concept about audiobooks away from our conversation today, what would you hope that would be? It's a growing market that you don't want to miss out on. If you want to get the word out, promote your entire platform as a speaker, coach, trainer, consultant, thought leader, your voice, it's the voice of your brand in many, many cases. And why miss out on being able to uh, disseminate your voice in an intimate way to a broader audience that may not have the time to read? So, Love it. Now, how do people get Thank connected you. and stay connected to really more great. David Wolf? Really grateful for this, David. Thank you so much uh, for having me. Audiobooksolution.com. No S on the end of that. So audiobooksolution.com. We just set up a, a, a very dedicated website for the audiobook, those desiring, uh, whether they're publishers or authors or self-published authors that are interested in exploring this. I'll do a 15 to 20 minute call with anyone who, there's a little button you can sign up and just schedule with me. It's really easy, one click. And uh, that's the way to get a hold of me. That's the best way to, to kind of leg into what this is all about, Alfie. Beautiful. All right, my friend. Thank you, sir. We will have you back soon. Cheers. Cheers. Thank you so much, David. Well, that wraps up another episode of The Speaking Show. Hey, tell you what, if you like us, rate us and review us on iTunes. Subscribe, tell a friend. Go grab the notes and downloads and extras at thespeakingshow.com. See you next time.